What does this word difference mean? Subtract. 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 Okay, we're going to subtract something from something else. Okay? Uh, when you say the difference of this and that, uh, what you are doing is implying that order. This minus that. The difference of 7 and a number n. And that's important because n minus 7 wouldn't be the same thing. 7 minus n. Um, so if p people are sharing 16 slices of pizza, we want to write an expression. Right. And if you weren't sure, then uh, what if four people were sharing this 16 slices of pizza, how would you divvy it up? You do um, the number of people divided by the pizza, or the 16 divided by p, or no, p divided by 16. <laughs> so let's say there's eight people, and there's 16 pieces of pizza, okay? 16 pieces of pizza. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And you had eight people sharing. How would you divide that up? How would you figure out how many each person gets? All right, there's 16 pieces of pizza. You divide it into eight groups, right? We're going to divide it by eight. Divide 16 by eight. So not every group uh, in those eight groups has two pieces of pizza. Each person gets two slices. So it's 16 <laughs> slices divided by the number of people. Divided by eight people, people. Divided by two people. What? I said that and then you stared at me. Because you're not confident. You need to be confident in your answer. I was. Say it. I was confident in my own three answers. You can't be confident in the three different things that aren't the same thing. I'm still confident. <laughs> real confidence. Um, okay. I'm going to write an equation or inequality for this sentence here. Just break it down, right? Product. What does product mean? Multiply. So you're going to multiply something. The product of 9 and. Okay. So product of 9 and something else. We're going to multiply 9 by something. Okay. By the quantity. What is, what's the word quantity mean? The amount. Right? Um, and when we say quantity, we don't, we're not typically going to say the quantity 3. Right? The quantity 7. The, or even the quantity x. Quantity is usually, at least in math, reserved for a group of, 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 of something, a bunch of things put together. When we say quantity in math, a lot of times that's what that means. So uh, the quantity, usually meaning there's several things going to go together to make this quantity, which means those several things going together then need to get multiplied by 9, the product of this quantity and 9. So the quantity is 5 more than a number t. So what what would five more mean? Five. What's that? Five plus. Five plus, plus five, it's all the same, right? Addition is commutative. So uh, something plus five, uh, t, t plus five. The quantity, t plus five. So we can run through that again. The product of nine, so nine times something. Nine times the quantity, five more than the number t, five more than the number t. Uh, we want that to be less than 6. And this guy right here, x plus 9 equals 17. We want to see if 8 is a solution. What would it mean if 8 was a solution to this equation? Yeah? It would mean that 8 would equal x if it was a solution to it. I mean, okay, so 8 would work in place of x. Yeah. Okay. So if we put 8 right there, what will happen to this equation? It'll be right. It'll be right, yeah. It'll be right, it'll be true. Same goes with an inequality. Any solution to this inequality will be one that makes the left side less than 6. Any questions about this or about any other homework? Problem? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 
In which section? Okay, um, so this is the work of a, of a person. They had uh, $2 a foot. What, what in your real world life might be $2 a foot? Can you buy wood for $2 a foot, right? That's something realistic. Well, I don't know about realistic, but it, it could be that. I don't know if it's $2 a foot. I'm, I'm just spitballing. I mean, you're spitballing. That's a good spitball. <laughs> it makes sense. Okay. How about anything you can buy by the foot? You can go to the store, you can buy a chain by the foot, you can buy carpet. Fruit by the foot. Carpet. It's usually a square foot. Right? Fruit by the foot. Yeah. Oh, Subway. Subway. Yes, you buy, you buy Subway soon? Just buy Oh my God, that sounds so good. Okay, they're $5 a foot. Some of them. Okay, so something is $2 a foot. And if something is two dollars a foot, and you multiply it by twenty-four feet. What will the number that you get be? Forty-eight feet. Forty-eight dollars. Forty-eight dollars. Forty-eight something. Yes, forty something is the important part here. Forty-eight dollars. Forty-eight dollars. Um, it is forty-eight dollars for twenty-four feet. Uh, right, but we don't. We don't get division by twenty-four feet by doing this calculation. We get two times twenty-four is forty-eight. Uh, it's forty-eight. No, just put it in the basket. Okay. No. The thing that says Tanya. Oh. Um, forty-eight dollars. It's just forty-eight dollars. Okay. One way you can be sure is you can put this over one, right? And then the units. If the if you have common units between numerator and denominator, you can cancel those out, and we're left with dollars. But it's it's not that difficult. If you bought say rope by the foot, and this was two feet, and it cost. Or sorry, one foot. One foot. It costs two dollars. If you bought uh, twenty-four feet of that stuff, and just put a little break there, and we wind up getting twenty-four feet of it. Every foot's going to cost two dollars. We multiply the two dollars per foot times twenty-four feet. We're going to get forty-eight dollars that we spent in a row. That's just done. So it's, this mistake is getting feet squared. That's not right. It's just dollars, forty-eight dollars. Seven. Converting stuff. These are all conversion ratios. 
when you multiply nine yards by three feet per yard, what are we doing? If you multiply nine yards by three, then what are we doing? Multiply. We are multiplying. <laughs> And when we get that nine yards times three feet, what have we just found out? What's a yard? Three feet. It's three feet, okay. So when we take that nine yards, every one of which is three feet, and we multiply nine times three, what have we just discovered? 27. 27 what? What's the significance of the number 27? Feet. feet. So there's 27 feet in nine yards. Okay, so 27 feet. We've just converted yards into feet. We write this over one, and the numerator and denominator have a common uh, unit, and you can cancel that unit out. So now these together are just 27 feet. And then there's something, rope or something, it costs $2 per foot. Okay, we have 27 feet of it, and we multiply by $2 a foot. What should we wind up getting? What are the units of that answer? 54 what? Dollars. Just dollars? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just dollars, right? Our feet cancel out, we get 54 just dollars, not dollars per foot. We already know how much it is per foot, it's $2 per foot. Mm -hmm. I guess something that's $2 per foot be $54 per foot. If anything, it's $54 for 27 feet. Uh, any more questions? No? Okay. Can I pass in the homework, please? <coughs> exactly what a function is by using this analogy. Okay. Um, and then explaining what are all these tables and graphs and all that kind of stuff and what they had to do with functions. Okay. So a function is a lot like this factory. Okay. On the side of the factory, here's the loading dock and the trucks come down here and the stuff is delivered and they turn that stuff into other stuff. right? That's exactly what a function is. So it takes stuff and turns it into other stuff. Now, the functions that we use in math are not usually factories that, that make uh, you know, cans of tuna or tables or uh, whatever they make. Uh, our functions, our factories, make numbers. And what do they make numbers out of? Out of numbers, exactly. Okay. So maybe this factory is a 2x plus 1 factory. So into this function, into this function goes a four. What comes out of this function? Nine. Nine. Two times four is eight, plus one gives us nine. And another one, two. Let's say negative two goes into this function. Negative two goes in, and what comes out? Negative five. What does? Negative five. No. Negative four. Two eight. times negative two? Negative four. Negative four. Negative four. Oh, three. Plus negative one? Three. Negative, negative three. three. Thank you, Ethan. <laughs> for saying it several times. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, the function is up and running. It's turning numbers into other numbers. And what we want to do, what's a big deal in algebra, is to keep track of all of this stuff that's happening. That this went in and this came out. All right? 
And we could keep drawing these uh, arrows with the numbers at the end of them and then numbers coming out the other end, but that would uh, take a long time. It's not very efficient. It takes up a lot of space. First we have to draw a big picture of a factory and then we have to draw arrows swooping in there and it's not very efficient, right? So what we want to do is find the best way to keep track of all of that. So this is us. This is our job. Right here. This is us. We got our hard hats on, right, and our and our bright bright vests, so that everyone can see us and how important we are. We're keeping track of stuff. Okay. And uh, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get our clipboard out and we're gonna record this stuff. All right. Um. So now that we have our clipboard. What are some ways that we can keep track of this? What, what are some ways that I could, for once, or for instance, uh, show that four was went into this factory and was turned into a nine? How can I possibly show that? Any way you can think of, yeah? Um, well, you can that. Well, I'm not asking how do we turn four into nine. How do, all I'm trying to record is that it happened. That four went into this function and nine came out. How do I show that, that the four and the nine are related? That four is the input, right? That's an official math word. And that nine was the output for four. Ethan? Could you do the distributive property? Um, how would you suggest that using the distributive property would show that, that 9 came out for 4? Well, if you like, <coughs> did it except like, so writing like a 4 and then parentheses 2x plus 1, other parentheses, if you just did 4 going into 2x and then not going to 1, uh -huh. could you do that? That, that wouldn't mean? be the distributive property. Well, like, uh, and and again, all I'm trying to show is just a record, right? It's this guy's job. He's been given the job of standing outside the factory, just watching what's happening, seeing if four comes in and nine comes out, right? And it's just for his records. He's gonna file his paperwork away later, and he just wants to make record that four went in and nine came out. So, you can keep a chart. A chart. So. Now this isn't the chart, I'm, I'm just cutting the paper into four pieces for several different ideas, right? So we can make a chart, just like that. You put four there, and nine came out. See how that's working? You just put a four right there, and a nine next to that, and so we know that four went in and nine came out. All right, then we can make another line, and we can put negative two, and negative three came out of there. Okay. And maybe another thing happens, Zero goes in there, and what comes out? Zero. Wait, one. One. Zero times two plus one. So zero went in. Right? You just watched that happen and wrote down zero went in and one came out. A lot of the stuff that we're interested in is just tracking what went into the function and then what came out as a result. So a table is one way. What's another way that we can keep track of these things? We can do a graph. We're going to leave a graph to the very end. Because okay? it's like the end, um, maybe the best thing that we have so far for us in Algebra 1. Okay? Graphs are very useful. We use graphs all the time. And I don't want graphs to seem as magical to you as they seemed to me when I was in high school. I thought that there was an equation and there was a graph, and I saw no connection between the two other than I knew mean, this kind of equation was supposed to look like this much sense to me, so I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen to you. So we'll wind up doing a graph. What's another idea? Any way that you can think to communicate to another person, how would you do it? How would you communicate to another person that you were watching this function work, and a 4 went in and a 9 came out? How could you communicate that to another person? Any 
ideas will do. Obviously, they come in pairs. There's two of them, and they're ordered because the first thing is what went in, and the second thing is what came out, input and output. If we can, if you can get to, used to the idea of thinking of functions as things that have input and output, then it's going to make talking about them much easier. Okay? If you don't let this stuff soak in, and so to bounce off your skulls until the next time you might need to use it and you look it up then and you ask me to remind you of it, then it's not going to be very significant. Uh, but if you participate and you offer suggestions and you ask questions, then you're actually going to learn it. You're going to learn this stuff rather than just waiting around it for me to shovel it into the furnaces of your head. Okay? So. Another idea, what is something, without having to look in a book and, and feel like you can't know something until someone tells it to you, what's any idea that you have? I'd say just write down four went in and then came out. I could do that. Four went in and nine came out. Okay, here's another idea. Yeah. Four over nine. Four over nine. Okay, you can write four over nine, like like that, or the division. I mean that that's kind of an ordered pair, written a, a different way. You could write it that way. Okay, so that's an idea. Ethan, a seven leaf plot work. Seven leaf plot. Do you know what a seven leaf plot is? What? Do you know what a seven leaf plot is? I remember we did like the grade. Do you remember what it is? Like. So seven leaf plot is more like uh, you want to go around asking people uh, how old they are, something like that. And then you and you go up to and you have and you want to ask lots of people. So you want to ask people from single digits all the way through their nineties, right? So you put zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you put the other number over here, right? And then if someone's fifteen, you go to the one and over and you write a five. And if someone's 15 again, you go ahead and write another five. So, I mean, that's, that's what a seven leaf plot is for, and so we probably wouldn't use it for that. Just because it already, it already exists for our purpose. What about box and whiskers? Box and whiskers? Do you remember what box and whisker plots were for? No. Okay. You don't, you don't have to think in terms of things that already exist. ideas. Okay. Um, these are certainly ways that you could do it. Okay? And the, the limitation of any method that you use. Hilly? Line graphing? Line graphing? Yes. What is that? Uh, where you have lines. <laughs> you mean like this? Yes. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Okay. okay. Um, so these are perfectly good ways. But as I was saying, the, the limitation of any of them is these are taking up a lot of space. And they, if you're the guy who's supposed to write all this stuff down, it's kind of taking a long time, right? We want a way that's, that's quick and easy, 
Uh, it's efficient. It communicates the, the information you want to communicate uh, in a small area and a quick way to write down hill views. Um, like yes. line, line graphing, you take the one right above it and you find it. Okay, no, I'm not asking you to explain line graphing. Oh. Again, yeah, we're going to get there. Okay? Sorry. Okay. Uh, Uh, one other way that's a, a really common way to do it is just is called a mapping diagram. A okay, mapping diagram looks similar to, to these, but the thing about it is we we might write four negative two zero over here, though we might write one nine negative three. Right, so it's not straight across. Right, it's not communicating that. Uh, correctly right now. So what could I add to this mapping diagram that would make it so that you know 4 is supposed to go to 9? Arrows. arrows. Simple, easy, direct. That's not an arrow at all. There we go. Arrows. Okay, so mapping diagrams do just that. They take the stuff over here and they point arrows to things that go over there. Okay? They take your input and they point it with an arrow to its output. With a graph, let's see why a graph is kind of a nice invention that somebody came up with. I'm going to move this down a little bit. To show, say, this particular relationship right here, 4 goes to 9, 4 goes to 9, 4 goes to 9. Okay. On a graph, what we have, let me just put some tick marks on here. We have one number line. Remember number lines, right? We can graph things on number lines. Uh, and we just have another number line just put right on top of that other no number line perpendicular. Okay. So this, this axis right here, what we call an axis, we could call the input axis. Okay. That's where input goes. That's where we find information about input. And remember that input is just stuff that goes into the function. You put in. So if I wanted to just graph uh, that the input was 4, how would I show the input was 4 on this horizontal number line? Hunter? Um, go over to the right, 4 tick marks. 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? So you'd put a little dot right there, right? Or almost. Yeah, maybe. Well, if all we wanted to do is show that 4, right, 4 is a number that exists and it went into this function, we could just put a dot right there on the input axis, right? Oh. All right, but that's not all we want to show. We don't want to just show that 4 went in. What do we want to show also? Sure. The output. We want to show the output. That's exactly right. And so. If 4 goes in, how do we show that 9 came out? Trevor? Uh, put it on the y axis. Uh, uh, are you saying put a dot here at 4? So you, you combine those two, so like you go over 4 uh, and then go up 9. Above this mark here? Yeah. Right. Above. Right, right, right. I have seen in the past people put a dot at 4 and a dot at 9. Well, if you put lots of dots, how are you supposed to know which dot goes with what other dot? Right? So the way we show this, this partnership, this relationship between 4 and 9, is to put a dot uh, above 4 and to the right of 9. Okay, right? So we go over to the 4 and we go up 9, and that ordered pair, we usually uh, translate ordered pairs into coordinates, x and y coordinates, and there it is, at 4, 9, and it shows that when you put in 4, you get out 9. And then we can do the same for negative 2. It goes down to negative 3. Negative 2 is mapped to negative 3. 0 is mapped to 1. And if this guy set up this graph on his, on his paper that he's supposed to keep track of all this stuff for, and he gives himself plenty of room, as soon as 4 goes in and 9 comes out, he just puts a dot he's done. Right? Faster than anybody could write parentheses for common nine parentheses. That 
if we were to tell the story of the graph, that, that could kind of be the story of the graph. Why we use graphs? Because they are uh, a relatively small, efficient way to show what a function does. It takes a 4 and puts out a 9. It takes a negative 2 and puts out a negative 3. It does this, right? When this goes in, this comes out. And if we were to plot a bunch of these, this guy could hand this to his supervisor, and the supervisor could pick it up and really easily say, oh, I see, when 4 went in, 9 came out, right? So, of course, it's a silly scenario that somebody would be watching numbers fly into a building and then other numbers flying out and writing that down. But that's basically what a graph is for. That's what all these things are for. It's for just tracking inputs and outputs. Okay? Um, so, if you did not realize that, if you did not realize that that's what a graph is, it's just another way to track inputs and outputs, and all you've done is maybe you were taught how to do graph lines. Uh, maybe you were in pre-algebra, and you find the y-intercept, and you do the slope, and then you graph the line. Okay? The fact that points on that line are inputs and outputs for that function it may have escaped you. Okay, so that's why I wanted to go over it in as much detail as I could uh, in a way that's easy to understand. Um, was that easy to understand? Does that make all kinds of good sense? Okay. Let me just qualify for you what a function is. It's really specific, but it's not very difficult. So the first thing about a function is that it has inputs and outputs. You know, we've talked about that ad nauseum so far. So we can just put inputs go to outputs. That's how functions work. Okay? But lots of things work this way, and they don't work in the special way that a function works. Uh, a function works in this very special way that when it takes an input, it sends it to only one output. Not several outputs, not two outputs, not three outputs, not zero outputs. Okay, if it gets an input, it turns it into one other thing. So uh, every input has one and only one output. So when we say it has one, that means it doesn't have zero. When we say it has only one, it means it doesn't have any other number of outputs. So if something comes in, then only one thing goes out. Let me show you an example of a, of a function that has to do with numbers that does not follow this rule. Okay. Uh, so I'll draw a little factory here down here. A little miniature version of a factory where stuff can go in and then stuff can come out. Okay. This will be the square root of x factor. So into this function, or supposed function, into this factory, we'll put 16. So the square root of x factory looks for numbers. It looks for numbers that when you multiply them by themselves, you get whatever the original input was. Okay? So that's what this, this thing is doing. So what could the output be? Four. Four. Could the output be anything else? No. There's no other number that when you multiply it by its exact copy, you get positive 16. Negative four. Negative four. When you multiply negative four by negative four, do you get positive sixteen? We do. Negative times negative is positive. Okay. So this thing right here, is it a function? No, it's a factory. It's what we would call a relation. It relates one thing, an input to an output. But it doesn't do it in such a way that an input only has one output. Okay? Now, this is just a, you know, a side piece of information. Sometimes when this happens, when we have uh, supposed functions that, that do this, that violate this rule, we just say something like, only include the positive outputs. Okay? Only when, when you're asked what the square root is, square root function, then only tell us what the positive answer is. And that way, we won't get two outputs. We won't get negative answers. We'll only get the positive ones. And zero. If you put zero into this function, you should get a zero, which is a positive answer. That's just a quick example of something that turns one input into two outputs, uh, which we can't have. All right. Um, 
And other functions can, can be anything, anything that relates one input to an output. It doesn't have to be a mathematical formula. It could just be a table of data where you look up a basketball player and you find his average points per game in a given year. And that's a function. Um, so, are we ready to move on from this? Any explanation needed about any of these? Okay. If you feel like you know it so well, then that's great. It just means I'm a fantastic teacher because it's not sinking into everybody's head all the time. This, especially this, uh, what a graph is exactly. Uh, it gets missed from time to time. Uh, there you go. So we're in a section of the book. Here's something I'd like to do. Um, I want you to look at 6, 7, and 8. 6, 7, and 8. This is page like 38. Look at 6, 7, and 8. Okay, we just talked about what a function is, what defines a function. A very special piece that every input has only one output, not an only one output. So if you can look at 6, 7, and 8 and decide. Decide on whether any of those is not a function. It violates that rule that every input has only one output. Take a look at 6, 7, and 8 and see if 1 or 2 or 3 or all or none of those is not a function. What page? 38. So who thinks they found one that's not a function? Dawson. Just the third one, the main, the main input is a uh, field output. There you go. Three fourths is a single input, and you can see by the, napping, the mapping diagram that it, it is mapped to three and it's mapped to five. Okay, so not a function. Seven is out. Okay, are there any other ones that are not functions? Hildy? Uh, Didn't have your hand up. Connor? Okay, so let's talk about that. I like that you're kind of on the fence about it. You're not sure. Okay. So, 8 looks something like this. You got input and output. You got 7 and 13. That seems fine so far. You got 11 and 8. Seems good. And we have 21 to 13, which we have another 13, so it's making us question whether or not this is a function. Okay. Well, let's read the description, the, the, the specific part of the definition real quick here. Every input has one and only one output. Uh, seven, for example, is not a function because three-fourths has two outputs. But as long as every input only has one output, that's all that's required. So let's look again here. Let's look at seven, right? We just need to ask of every input, do you have only one output? Okay, so seven. Does seven have only one output? It does. It only has 13 as an output. And I don't see seven anywhere else here, so it's not possible for seven to have another output. So we go down to 11. Does 11 have one output? That's eight, yeah. Does 21 only have one output? Yeah. Yeah, it shares an output with seven, but that's not what the rule says. The rule says that a function for every input, only one output. So 7 only has one output of 13, 21 only has one output of 13, uh, 35 only has one output of 20. So yeah, it is a function. Even though two inputs have the same output, it's not what the rule says. It doesn't say every output has one and only one input. It doesn't go that way. Okay? Make sense? You guys get the difference? Eight's okay. Eight is a function that checks out. Okay. Uh, let's let's look at this function for example. For this next part. Just look at all of the inputs. Look at all the inputs together, and you group them together in one place. Set them aside, and that's what we call the domain. 
<coughs> and if you group all of the outputs together, they also have a name. There's the domain for the inputs. All the outputs together are called the range. Another way we could write this, the domain is a squiggly bracket, 7, 11, 21, 35. Close the squiggly bracket, that's the domain. The range, squiggly bracket. Uh, we don't even have to write it in the same order. It could be 8, 13. And since 13 is there twice, we don't have to write it twice. We're just saying that 13 is one of the things that comes out of this function. And then we just go to 20. So that's fine. You don't have to write 13 twice when you're trying to write the range. So you could if you wanted to, it would just be kind of redundant. When we say the domain, we're saying here's all the things that can go into the function. And when we say the range, we're saying here's all the things that can come out of the function. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to have you do this for, uh, for number five. Do number five. I just want you to write the domain and to write the range. <coughs> it's easy. Great. Then do it. And you'll be solid. If it's not easy, then great. We'll clear things up. into the function are 6, 12, 21, and 42. So 6, 12, 21, 42. Those are the things that go into the function. Range is the set of all the things that come out, the set of all the outputs. 5, 7, 10, and 7. This word mapping is it's like a special map word. Okay? It's not used in the way that you normally think of a map. A map is like a layout of the land, and this thing is so far away from this thing, and you get an idea of where stuff is in relation to other stuff. Okay? So you could kind of draw correlations between that map and, and the map that we say in math. But this mapping just really means like sends to, okay? This word mapping is used in computer science as well. Anybody play video games here? Computer games? Computer are your console players. You all just play Halo, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a bit old. You're what? I'm a bit old. What do you play on computer? What? What do you play on computer? Usually I'm a little off the past. Kids. So uh, if you play, let's say a computer game, you play you know, Left 4 Dead or I don't know, Bioshock, is that a computer game or is that a console game? It's both. It's both, okay. Well, if you play on the, on the computer, it's, it's not as obvious as when you have a controller, right? If people don't typically play with controllers, it's kind of what they like about playing on a computer. So on a, on a computer game, if you're running around and you're, and you're also using your mouse to look and all that kind of stuff, and you put your fingers on the keyboard, you usually put them on W, A, S, D, A -S -D right? right? But they don't, when you, when you play the game, it, when you press W, it doesn't just make a W appear on the screen, right? It maps to something else. W maps to what? Forward. Forward. Moving forward. And A maps to? Moving to the left. And S maps to? 
backwards and D maps to going right. Why don't they just use a little key that say forward, backwards, to the side? Just they have the arrow, but then you can't use the mouse. You have the air, you do have the arrows. You switch the keyboard over here. But hey, listen, do you want the answer or what? <laughs> if you use the arrows, I think the main thing is there's lots more keys over here, and the, and the the A S D W combination is a lot like the arrows, and you have all this other stuff like you want to switch weapon, Baseball, pick something up, you want to open up a door or whatever you want to do, a melee attack or something. Yeah. Then you. You want other keys. So that's, I think that's why it's over there. I've never played What's that? Yeah, different stuff on the numbers. You guess, yeah, the numbers might be your inventory or something like that. That's why that is. Anyway, uh, that's, that's an example of mapping. It just goes to it. The W goes to moving you forward. The, the S moves to, or goes to moving you backwards and, and so on. So that's the idea of mapping. That's what that word. If you want to sound uh, like really advanced, then you use the word mapping. It maps to that. Okay. Uh, anyway, that's a, a little word about that. And um, let's move on to well, unless there's any questions, got anything we've gone over? What's a function? What is a function? What defines a function? Hildy? Um, it has input and output, yep. and every input has only one and one, one and one only output. Yes, oh. one and only one output. Or you could say, a little bit shorter, you could say exactly one, right? Which means no other number could work, not even zero. So it has exactly one output. Uh, what's the domain? Nathan? It's um, the number that it's the output. Input. input. The in, and not just one input, but all oh, the okay. Inputs. The range. Oh, I mean, the what's range the range? The, the range is the output. The it's domain is the input. Yes. So the range is all the outputs, just grouped together. Okay. And the domain is all the inputs grouped together. If you write them all down, that's what the domain is. That's what the range is. Okay. Um, next, one point seven. So. 1.6 essentially is, is uh, the first three ideas that, that the guy working at the factory had. Tables, mapping diagrams, ordered pairs. Okay? 1.7 is about that last idea of graphs, and a graph function. So let's just see uh, you know what we're doing when it comes to graphing. Um, so an easy one, number three, y equals x plus three. And the domain of this function, they're going to tell us specifically is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now that's the domain. The domain is what? What's the definition of the domain? Inputs. All of the inputs for this function, right? So that, does that mean you're going to go on and put 6 into this and 7 and 8? No. No, this is all the inputs. Are you going to put in 2 and a half? No. Nope, it's not in the domain, right? It's right there. The domain is these numbers right here, these six numbers. Those are the six that go in. So if it's a function, you should only get six out, okay? And now I want you to also take that information and graph it, okay? Go ahead and do that. You're not sure how, try your best. All right, so um, what I saw a lot of people doing was <coughs> creating a table, which is a great idea. Okay, But a table isn't a, well, it's not a graph that we're talking about. So it won't be the end of it, but it will help us to graph it really easily because we'll know exactly where this, this stuff is supposed to go. So we'll put in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. And what we're doing here, and it seems to have uh, not quite sunk in with everyone, so what's happening is the input will go in for x. Typically, that's the letter we use, x. 
And, and then when we do all the math and we get all done, well, that number will be y, right? So when we put 0 in for x for the input, and we add 3, we get 3 for the output. Right? Once all this is done, we get 3, y equals 3. Okay, we put a 1 in there, 1 plus 3 is 4. When we do that math, 4, y equals 4. Put a 2 in there, 3, we get 5, we get 6, 7, and 8. So the graph will look like this. Uh, we just need to mark off some tick marks. So, 0, 3, green. Uh, 1, 4, go over to 1. 1 was put in, and what came out was 4. It's all the way back to the guidance clipboard and keeping track of what went in and came out of this function. 2 gives us 5, 3 gives us 6, 4 gives us 7, and 5 gives us 8. Okay. That is not a, not a great graph, but a, a decent graph that, that uh, at least plots those points pretty well. Okay. Now, are we going to connect these dots with a line? No, because that would imply that we can put in 0.5 into this function, or one and a half, or two and, and three fourths, or whatever. That's not what it says. The domain is specifically these six numbers. Okay. Now we can do it for a different problem, and we can put in different numbers, or we can just say, hey, go crazy, put in any number you want. This problem, they're saying the domain is what it is. So we're only going to get outputs for the things in the domain. If it's not, out, if it's not in the domain, if it's outside the domain, and it doesn't go into the function, and therefore it doesn't have any output. Okay. Any questions about anything? Can I open the window, please? Yes. Can you help her out, Tommy? <laughs> okay. That'll be nice. Well, we'll just go with this. This is example three. Okay. It's a table. It's just like any other table. It just turns sideways. So that's what we got. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so what we want to do here is write a rule. Okay, it's like a directions that you give somebody, right? Uh, so, what would you be your directions for getting to the high school office from here? Someone's Becca. Leave your classroom. Leave my classroom, okay? Okay, turn left. Okay, take an immediate left. Yeah. All right. Um, and then walk down the hallway to the city lockers. Okay. And take a right. Take a right at the lockers. And walk down the hallway. Yeah. And then take a right at the drinking fountain. Okay, take a right. And then walk down until you see the doors and then uh, take a left and keep going left. straight. Uh, and it's like three. So right there is that glass box. Mm -hmm. Half, halfway down the hallway. Okay. It's just directions, right? Starting from here, you go out the door. You take a left. You go to the locker. You turn a right. You turn right again at, at Miss Blackard's room, maybe, and take a left when you get to Miss Bryony's room, and then keep going until you see uh, Miss Alzheimer sitting there in the big glass box, right? So just directions. When you start here, this is how you do it. Okay. So these are just directions. If you start at x, how do you get from x to y? 
right? We're not going to use left turns and right turns. We're going to use addition and multiplication and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So if I start with x, okay, what's a rule that will always turn every one of these x's into their corresponding y? Plus something? Yeah. Plus what? One. Plus one. If we add one to the x, will we always get the y? Plus one, two plus one, three plus one, four plus one, five plus one. Okay? How much easier could that get? Uh, no. Oh no. How much, how much easier it could be? So let's do, uh, make one up. Okay? And I don't need another x. How about starting at one? Um, let's see, go one, and three, five, seven, and nine. So that's a rule that could take us from any x to one. To Wait. Steering, but we know that's not going to work. Nathan? Okay, so like you take the other x. The other x? Like the one before that x, and you add it to the the um, x that is currently in use, like 2 plus 1 is 3, and then 3 plus 2 is 5, and then 4 plus 3 is 7, and 5 plus 4 is 9. Um, that's what's called a recursive definition. It's a recursive definition. Recursive means you have to go back to the step before to figure out the current step. Am I correct? <laughs> Uh, you found a pattern that works, but it's not going to be a rule like a, like a function is a rule. It, you can't make an equation out of that. Well, unless you could. Could you make an equation out of that? I'll find a way. It would be a little tricky, but it, it could happen. Yeah? Yeah, it's a new problem. Just a minute up one. Plus one for the first one, plus one, plus three, plus four. Plus one? No. No, the first one's zero. First one's zero? Yeah, and one's plus zero. Add one, add two, add three, add four, add five. Is that what you're saying? Well, one plus zero. Zero plus one, one plus two. Um, um, I don't know. Well, it's 3 plus 2, 5 plus 2, 7 plus 2. Okay, we add 2 every time we go up. But the thing you're doing, and it's good, you're recognizing a pattern. And, and math is all about pattern recognition. What we're trying to do, though, is create uh, you know, a factory, a function, that when you put in a number, it just goes through mathematical operations, right? It goes in the place of x, stuff happens to it, and it comes out as the correct output. Okay. Toby? It's okay. It's okay to think. Questions? What's all this other stuff that needs to happen? another pattern that goes up by twos every time? Is that like when you count by twos? Just two, four, six, eight, ten. Look at that. Two, four, six, eight, ten. What if two, four, six, eight, ten were the output? What would, what, how would you get from one to two and two to four and three to six and so on? Um, I don't know what's more subtracting. Like one minus three is two and then two minus five. I mean, 5 minus 2 is 3, and then 7 minus 3 is 4, and 9 minus 4 is 5. That's kind of the same thing as Nathan said. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, you, so you're jumping right off of here. You're saying, 
these are almost multiples of two, right? That's how multiples of two, that's the pattern of multiples of two. They go up by two every time, right? Like this, two, four, six, eight, ten. But they're not multiples of two. They're close to multiples of two, right? How far away from a multiple of two is each of them? It's one away, right? So if I take, if I take the x and I do two x, does it give me two, four, six, eight, ten? Two times x? Two times three, two times three is six. Two times five is ten. Okay, but it's a little bit off. But then if we take those and we subtract 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, 4 minus 1 is 3, 6 minus 1 is 5, 8 minus 1 is 7, 10 minus 1 is 9. So if we take 2 times x and then we subtract 1, that should give us y. Okay. Click directions. How to walk down the hallway. Take your number, start there, multiply it by 2. After you get there, subtract 1, and that'll, that's it. You're there. 2 times x minus 1. do to x to get y. Try not to um, rely on just patterns between here to there, from there to there, from there to there. See how you could take x and turn it into y. Just start at x and get to y. Outputs are getting pretty big pretty fast, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Faster than, say, 2x minus 1. So you must be doing something pretty powerful to x, right? Not just adding something or just subtracting something. You're not even just multiplying it by a single number. Like the numbers you're multiplying by get bigger as x gets bigger. Throw out an idea, maybe look at 2 and 8. How could you go from 2 and get to 8? Times 4. Times 4, real natural uh, instinct to have. Multiply it by 4, okay? But if we go to 3, if we come over to 3, and we multiply it by 4, what do we get? 12. We get 12, and 27 is quite a bit bigger yeah. than 12, right? And if we even come over to 4, 4 times 4 is 16, 16 and 64 is much bigger than 16. But it seems like probably multiplication is involved, right? Because multiplication makes numbers into pretty big numbers. That makes sense. Just adding a number is not as significant as multiplying a number. Maybe let's see what we're multiplying each number by. Let's try that. Multiplying 1 by 1. 2 by 4. Okay, let's, we can kind of keep track of this. 2 times 4. This is 3 times 9. nine. nine. This is 4 times Twelve. Twelve. not 12. Ah. Just two, two, six, 16. Um, you see any pattern among these numbers? Any kind of pattern 
four, nine, sixteen. Yeah. Even? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna try even first. Um, when you like, so two times two is four. Yeah. And then when you multiply it by itself, uh -huh. that's the even place. Two times two is four, and you multiply that by what? You multiply two times four. Oh. Equal a. Caitlin, can you can you box it together a little more nicely? Yeah. Like the three times four, if you add four and two together, it's six. And then if you add the three, and you add the three and you add nine, and then the three plus nine is like twelve. And then you add the four and it equals sixteen. Um. Is that it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the, the difficult thing though is when you say do these, like take these and then roll that into this next one, that's what we're, we're getting into those recursive definitions. You're going to see how can I relate this directly to that? The same way that I can relate this directly to that. Nathan? X cubed. X cubed. What does cubed mean? Uh, times itself three times, like one times one times one. Then two times two times two. So is this eight. one times one times Six. one? Six. Six. Two times two times two, right? That's four. Three is two times two. two. Three times three nine times is three times three. Four, four times four times four. Times four. So y <laughs> equals x cubed. I figured it out. <laughs> so look at that. It's like it looks like it's almost like I'm multiplying the number by two, but it's a little off. Or it looks like I'm multiplying the number by three, but it's a little off. Or it looks like I'm squaring the number, but that's a little off, right? It's, it's going to be generally the way it is. Two times x, four times x, x divided by two. These rules are pretty easy. Okay, so they're going to make it a little more challenging. Got it? They're going to be hard. They're going to get harder. But I guess in the homework, not as hard as it is. But just start with a rule that seems like it's working, but it's just a little off, like this one. We're noticing we're adding two every time, which is what we do when we count by two. It's two, four, six. When we count by multiples of two, that's the pattern as well. So it's almost like two times x, but it's a little off. So we took two x but then subtracted one, 2x minus one, 2x minus one, 2x minus one. Look for those patterns. Maybe it looks like you're going up by multiples of three, but you're a little off, so maybe it's 3x plus two, or 3x minus one, something like that. All right, good job, thanks a lot. Yes? I have an off topic of question. How did you get all the fonts different on all these papers? I, the paper, I just, Chose a font from my computer and then projected it up here. We just um, taped them up. Yeah. Um, I have a question. And it's off topic. It's like almost identical to hers, but on the Abraham Lincoln thing, uh, I don't get that saying. Um. Okay. But it's kind of old timey wording. Whoa. <laughs> so he, I had a person, yeah. has the right. So he has the right. So the person has the right to criticize. So you have the right to criticize. Uh, who has the heart to help. So the same person, this is the same person who has to have the heart to help in order to have the right to criticize. Oh, because I thought it was like someone was criticizing someone. Someone had the right to criticize someone else who was the right to help. I didn't make it. Now, this is the pronouns, and they have to refer to the same thing unless you change the same thing. So we have to do it as we're going to play. I did that on the